I always come back to this because I like being introduced by Jane. <laughs> so the Pew Research Center self-describes as a fact tank. We are not funded by the Pew Charitable Trust to do any advocacy, uh, to make any recommendations for the world, to further an agenda. Uh, a lot of the work I'll be talking about today was funded actually by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But going through the Pew Research Center protocols, um, they don't expect me to be an advocate for librarians. Uh, that's not what the purpose of our research. We're supposed to be objective. We're supposed to be um, uh, high-level social scientists uh, who generate information with um, a lot of authority behind it. But we are not here to make you feel better. But I'm always asked back because our data really comes out well for, for lots of <laughs> of librarians, and if you've seen me before in any library context, and I take it as my mission, wherever two or three librarians are gathered, they ought to be talking about Pew Data. So if you have meetings in your offices that don't have us in it, I'm happy to come talk to you about us. Um, but our motto at the Pew Research Center, as we've gotten so deeply engaged with the library community, is that any day spent with librarians is a better day. So thank you for making this a wonderful day uh, uh, for me. But I, I, I want to at least violate it, one of the sort of strictures of the Pew Research Center because we're, we're kind of cool nerds. Um, and we're cool enough that The Onion, uh, with, with some regularity, writes up fake stories about Pew Research that has never been done, but it's pretty hilarious to do. Um, so this was a recent one. If you go to The Onion and you search for Pew Research, you'll see a ton of things. <laughs> but this is a story they wrote uh, off, uh, off one of our uh, alleged studies. Majority of Americans still remember where they were when Gandalf fell into the abyss. And in the piece, they go on to, uh, to say, the poll found that many Americans possess near photographic memories of their precise location, who they were with, as well as the emotions experienced by seeing Balrog wrap his fiery whip around Gandalf's leg. The poll also showed many Americans later struggled to broach the subject of Gandalf falling into the bottomless pit with their young children. So that's what cool nerds experience in, uh, in the modern age when people uh, can make fun of you. And we're delighted that The Onion uh, thinks that we're uh, worth making fun of. And, and we're kind of cool enough that we, we appreciate that, although not for the record. Um, We've done a whole bunch of work in the past five years specifically related to how Americans think about libraries, uh, th think about librarians, and use libraries. And I'll just uh, run through a quick roster of our stuff. You can find it on pewinternet.org. If you go to the topics, look for libraries, you'll see a, a deep archive of material that walks through this five years of research. But here are some of the, uh, the highlights from it. Every time we ask questions and every way we frame questions about the importance and meaning of libraries, we find that Americans as a whole, including people who are not intense library users, and in many cases, people who don't use libraries at all, think that libraries are important. And they think that they're important for their communities even if they themselves are not active participants. They trust you and they like you. Uh, you might have heard me say in the past that there has been a catastrophic decline in trust for lots of industrial era institutions in the information age. And you, you see about it all the time. You know, there's a deep decline in, in trust in government. There's also a decline in trust in corporations, especially banks after the Great Recession. There's a deep decline in trust with the media. There's been a decline in trust in major church organizations. Librarians have bucked that trend. The, you are still beloved in the public imagination. You, you're sort of in the same category as firefighters and teachers, which is not a bad tribe to be part of. And Americans think about you in really different ways from the ways they think about lots of other public servants and public facing servants. They just think that the mission of librarians, which they kind of deeply understand, is one that serves them and, and their communities really well. People, uh, they especially like you because they think you level the playing field for those uh, who don't have the resources that the better off people in your communities have. Uh, it, it, one of the most attractive things about libraries is that you are equal opportunity. 
and that anyone who walks through or en engages the library in any way, walks through your door, uses your website, goes to a bookmobile or anything like that, um, they, they appreciate that you are doing outreach, that you are serving people who don't necessarily have um, everything, uh, they can buy everything that they need or they have sort of other ways to get to the information and enrichment material that you guys provide. Uh, they believe you've rebranded yourselves as tech hubs. This is one of the lesser um, understood stories as, as far as the funder and policy making community understands, but the, your, your patrons know that you have become vital technology centers in your communities. They've watched computers proliferate. They've watched as you've changed the configuration of your spaces. They are deeply appreciative of it, and they, don't, and they see this absolutely as consistent with the longstanding mission of librarians, and they celebrate it. Um, and in, in some respects, it's, it's an interesting and odd mismatch between the way your patrons see this and appreciate it, especially millennials who have gone through, I mean, they've observed you changing as they've marched through their school years, the, the appreciation that you get from the public in those spheres, as opposed to some of the struggles you have with, stakeholders, with, with policymakers and funders and, and folks who aren't necessarily as tuned in uh, to that reality. And people still read books. This comes as a shock when we report it every year. The data don't change all that much, but we want to keep measuring it because every time we gather new data on this, uh, we report it to journalists. One of the big missions of the Pew Research Center is to disseminate our work broadly, and we start always with mass media doing this. And I can't tell you how many times over the years you get sort of head-slapping uh, stories from journalists saying, wow, people still read books. And even more importantly, we have this sub-headline saying they like printed books more than they like e-books. Now, don't abandon your e-book purchases and your uh, embrace of that, but, but by a three-to-one margin, people are more likely to say that they appreciate printed books and to use printed books than they use e-books, even as the you know, tablets and other devices have proliferated through the population. It's the stuff that you guys know and rhapsodize about, right? There's something special and magical about having that thing in your hand and having that experience um, that is sort of, un, uh, at least for now, not replicable in, in, in technology spaces. And so um, it's a struggle in, in some ways to embrace this reality because I'm sure you're getting lots of encouragement in whatever spaces you have to sort of de-emphasize the books and, uh, and find other ways to serve your patrons through other pathways to information and other kinds of configuration of your spaces. But this is still a core reality of the world uh, that you live in. Now you'll notice, um, I, I know librarians well enough to know you like cats. Uh, so I'm gonna pander uh, to, to that need um, now and just, um, I unashamedly hope that you uh, enjoy the trip with me. Here's, here's our latest data on library usage. usage. In, in um, late 2016, we did our normal survey. Do you use the library? Do you use the library website? 48% of uh, people who are 16 years old and older used a library or bookmobile in um, the past year. It's a, it's a number that has dropped a little bit from one of our first studies in 2012 related to that, but it's, it's sort of, it bounces around now at this level. About half of, of adults in this country use a library at one point or another uh, during the previous 12 months. The website numbers are not as robust, but about a third of American adults, 16 and older, are using library websites. They appreciate the ease of that. They appreciate increasingly the capacity to download and access material and, and things like that. But it's interesting that this number, which we kind of thought when we started doing this research, this number was gonna just keep going up and up and up. And it's fine, it's a good number. It means you have to you know, be careful about how you um, tend to your website and you've gotta be vigilant about that kind of stuff. But it's, it's just as a share of the population, it's not nearly as much as people who still want to use your facilities, your physical facilities, and, and take great advantage of that. 
Um, in both sets of numbers, um, again, consistently over the years, women more than men uh, use both library facilities and library websites. Younger people uh, more than older people do, which is sometimes shocking to librarians because you know the sort of senior citizens who are crazy lovers of, of your libraries. But it's still the case that as a proportion of the population, younger people are more engaged with libraries than older folks are. And tends to be more upscale. People who have higher levels of education, higher levels of income, are also more likely to be users of library facilities and library websites. Which, again, creates a real tension in your life because many of you got into this business and spend your days thinking about how you're going to serve those folks who don't necessarily have higher levels of education and don't necessarily have lots of income. And, there, and so there's a tension in your life that's sort of framed by the business literature on the innovator's dilemma. You've got people who, want, who need to be served right now who are really avid customers. Let's call them that. But you also want to serve people who aren't necessarily thinking of you first when they want to access information to enlighten or enrich themselves. And so you're struggling and, and working really hard to make sure that you're available to those people, in part because, again, sort of the public imagination is that you're doing uh, a lot of work to serve people who have lesser resources. I, I wish there were a way to thread the needle on, on that paradox. But there isn't. You just have to keep working at it and, uh, and keep hoping that, that you will be connecting with more and more people who don't necessarily have higher uh, income and higher levels of education. Uh, at the same time, making sure that you don't you know, annoy the people who love you the most. Um, these are data that we collect about sort of various uses of libraries. I uh, hope you can read the slide. It'll be available to you so you can linger over it a little bit more. But the library patrons are, are the one thing that jumped from 2015 to 2016 in a notable way was attending classes and programs and lectures. So the changes that lots of libraries are making to, to add more programming and to make their spaces more available for community needs is having um, some level of payoff, and, um, and folks are, are, you know, those of you who are thinking about, talking about, and implementing maker spaces, you know, that's the bottom right number down there, and it's, a, it's a, more than a tenth of library patrons are using that stuff, and they m mostly expect you to keep doing that. Even if they're not necessarily comfortable with it or interested with it, they want you guys to be in the vanguard of technology um, embrace and technology fluency because they're suspecting that at some point they will want to have this stuff in their life and that the library would probably be a good place to road test it. Uh, the other thing that we talk about is how people use technology in libraries. This is a talk about how, how technology meets library patrons' need. Again, the, the sort of one most interesting uptick is on the right side, take online classes or complete online certification. One of the great urgencies that we saw during the last election in America, and it's, it's true all over the world, is that people are now um, increasingly recognizing that their job skills and their jobs themselves potentially are in jeopardy both by sort of globalization and trade and contract workers, but even more dramatically because of technology and its capacity through robotics, artificial intelligence, automation, and things like that, to challenge the basic stuff that they do at their jobs. So there are more and more people now thinking that they constantly have to reevaluate uh, their skills level and its relevance to their current job or its relevance to the job that they aspire to get. And more and more people, particularly millennials, it's really interesting, compared with their parents, now think that their jobs, they hope that their jobs are careers. They're not just the thing that you do during the day to get a paycheck to enable you to do other things in your life that have meaning and fit in with your identity. There's a, there's a, gr a growing awareness that jobs are deeply tied to identity and have deep meaning as careers, not, uh, not just the prosaic kind of stuff. And all of this activity in the training space and learning space, especially what's going on in libraries, is people who are, who are um, embracing that and, and try to be uh, uh, you know, persistent learners. Now, you'll notice that I, I've given speeches with only cat slides uh, a number of times. And librarians who are deeply attuned to discrimination have pointed out that dogs were not getting a fair shake. So I'm, I'm sprinkling dogs uh, into some of my, um, my slides here. This is, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the news of this presentation because I'm talking for the first time about new research that we've done. We haven't even published it yet. Um, that it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
And the, our aspiration was to look at, on behalf of librarians, but all sorts of knowledge enterprises, organizations, the differences between people that we broadly define as information engaged, they like information, they think it helps them make decisions, they are eager to get it, they like to learn and things like that, as distinct from the information wary. Sometimes they are wary, sometimes they're not sure that information has value, but it's a broader concept of people who don't necessarily think that acquisition of information can help them in significant ways. That they, uh, either the fates are in control of their lives or their lives are too stressed in other forms or they have other ways that they want to spend their time and stuff. So, that, you know, the, the population sorts out along a spectrum of it being engaged and, and being wary. And we wanted to understand that with a survey and some focus groups. And so we, to organize people's thinking about this, because it's a pretty amorphous subject, we asked about their general interest in a variety of sort of civically oriented um, and job-oriented topics, so things like, you know, they're interested in news and information about business, government, health, science, and things like that. Um, we, we were particularly interested in applying the really nice insights from Carol Dweck, who's now at Stanford and has written about people who have a growth mindset as distinct from people who have a fixed mindset. And her work has demonstrated that, the, that these characterizations and these characters of information uh, or approaches to information distribute through the population. It's not just certain kinds of people, certain kinds of demographics who are in a growth mindset and other kinds who are in a fixed mindset. It's, it's distributed across all kinds of groups, all kinds of classes, all kinds of racial and ethnic groups. So there's, there's a, it's a really interesting sort of distinct trait, psychographic you could call it, that helps orient people towards information in their life. And they're relevant to you because understanding people's approach to information is basically the business uh, you're in. Um, we wanted to fit this into uh, how they make decisions, how they think about information as a, as a helper for them making decisions. Uh, we obviously wanted to figure out how technology fit into that picture because people we found over the years that people who have lots of technology are different beasts from people who don't have lots of technology. They, they think differently, they act differently, they have different um, sort of stressors in their life about information overload as opposed to information scarcity and things like that. So that's obviously a, a major thing that we were looking at. We wanted to also, for obvious purposes, figure out where this fit in with their library use. To what degree was their wariness or engagement um, tied to um, their thinking about and their use of libraries. Um, and we also wanted to ask, as a, as a dependent variable, um, how they see the information ecosystem of the world. So how they get training on technology, would they like it, um, how they, what they, have they, their feelings about their own competence in finding trustworthy information, um, that whether they struggle to have access to libraries for one reason or another, and whether actually, you know, since so many people now live with their smartphone as their primary information device, to what degree uh, sell financial plans, you know, the data caps and things like that, to what degree that is a shaper of how people are engaged with or um, distant from information. So kind of cool work, and we, uh, nobody's ever done anything like this, so the writing the questionnaire and structuring the, the protocols for dealing with the focus groups was um, more than half the adventure uh, of doing this work. And to get right to the punchline, um, we found that a number of factors shaped uh, people's sort of tendencies to be more engaged or tendencies to be more wary or disengaged from information. Uh, access to and use of libraries is a pretty nice independent predictor of whether people are on one side of the spectrum or the other. Obviously, your heaviest users are the ones who love information the most. They just Literally, the fact of learning stuff is what turns them on. In many cases, they adore libraries and librarians. Uh, in some cases, they're, they're um, sort of your most interesting critics because they would like you to be doing more or like you to be fitting into more holes in their lives. But they do that from the spirit of, first of all, feedback and evangelism. They want you to be better because they know how awesome uh, you already are. Obviously, their personal tastes is a, is a big determinant of whether they're interested or engaged, uh, their life circumstances, um, also this, this growth mindset or, or fixed mindset is a, is a major determinant about how people fit on the spectrum. Um, we asked about their level of trust and in information and if people have higher levels of trust, they're more engaged. It, it kind of makes sense in a way, but it's an important thing to measure 
because trust is such a precious and, and, and concept that's being struggled over in our culture now. Uh, the systemic decline in, in um, trust in major institutions has accelerated in the past year, year and a half. Uh, and it's now more of a bone of contention. I mean, literally, for, for those of us at Pew who go out into the world and sort of proudly proclaim we're a fact tank, all of a sudden, in a way that was never um, anticipated to be, that's kind of a political statement now. I mean, we're, we, we, in our mission statement, we say facts matter to democracy, and you get better decisions out of legislators if the citizenry and the legislators themselves and the regulators are better informed. You know, in a way, that's a, that's a, being an empiricist now is somewhat of a, of a, of a partisan um, position. But people's trust in information it fits very um, deeply into this spectrum I've described of wariness uh, or, or um, engagement. Um, the, the growth mindset matters a lot. Um, the other thing in this second to last bullet is life circumstances and time horizons. The people who are most engaged with information and most eager to bring it into their lives um, are thinking a little bit more into the future. They are, um, they, they, when they make decisions, they like to gather information to make sure that they are aware of, of different possibilities. They don't necessarily enjoy information overload, but their stress level about that is, their tolerance for it is much higher than for people who are um, on the other end of the spectrum. And they, um, and, they, and they make decisions in a different way. They, they, they take longer, they deliberate more, they ping their networks and, uh, to get advice and, and things like that. Um, and those who feel stressed in any number of ways about their lives, including the volume of information that they feel they should be digesting if they were making the decision, just feels daunting to them. They don't necessarily get the help from their social networks that they do, so you guys, um, this is a theme I've hit a lot of times with librarian audiences, you ought to think like friends in people's networks as much as you think as sort of institutional, learning, engaged uh, actors in their lives. You know, you're a buddy. You tend to be the smartest buddy or the near smartest buddy in their personal networks, and you want to be available in the same way buddies are available uh, as people are making decisions because uh, when they shifted their trust from institutions, they transferred it to their personal networks. They rely on their friends to get them the information they want, to help them make the decisions they need to make, they, um, and, and to give them the, the emotional uh, support that they need if they're going through a struggle. So thinking like a networker is a really important thing for librarians to do. And then the final factor here that, that puts you on the spectrum of engaged or uh, wary is access to information technology. The people who have the most access for any number of reasons are more engaged than the people who have the least amount of access. But it's the one thing that might be the biggest change in people's lives. If you can make sure that they have at least basic provision of a smartphone or a tablet or something like that, that, that moves them up the ladder to higher levels uh, of engagement uh, just because they've got a tool now that makes it efficient and convenient and useful uh, to get the information they want. One of the things we did, uh, well, here, let me walk this through this, this uh, trust and information piece because you guys uh, sit at the top of the ladder when we ask people about uh, trust, trusted sources and trusted people in their lives to get them the information they want. So librarians um, are the, the, the top one here. You, you're right next to healthcare providers. That's a nice company to be in because it sort of marks you as experts in a way that maybe you don't even quite self-define that way, but you guys are definitely seen as, as sort of gatekeepers, curators of, of the better quality information or the pathway uh, to better information. Then family and friends is down the list. It, it's, uh, they're, they're good for a bunch of things in people's lives, but not for everything. Uh, government sources are um, considerably below that. Uh, local news organizations, national news organizations sort of fit um, below that. And social media, people um, sometimes when we ask questions about social media, people um, are kind of thinking, I, I, should, I shouldn't admit to these guys on the telephone that are interviewing me um, that I love my, you know, my social media and what my friends say and I'm, I'm as credulous as anybody when my friends recommend articles and stuff like that. But they, it's not, when, when, when they think about this, they're not thinking purposefully. Social media is sort of a different kind of thing in people's lives. They don't necessarily launch a social media platform to say, how am I gonna make this decision? I'm gonna 
you know, put out a query to the universe and my buddies are going to answer it and, uh, and that'll be the end of that. It's more um, sort of um, episodic and, and, their perp and their intention of being on social media is mostly to just, you know, find out what's going on in the world and find out what's going on with their friends. They're less instrumental in the way that they're thinking about social media, even though we for sure pick up lots of evidence, especially in the focus groups, that what their buddies are recommending on Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and LinkedIn and Pinterest and things um, is, has meaning to them. They're going to go to the sources that are recommended and linked to. They're going to check out the articles. They're going to um, maybe even engage in some conversation over it. So it, it does matter. It just doesn't matter when you ask these direct questions uh, as, a, as a level of trust. Then we took all of this data and we did some statistically fun things. We, we clustered people. This is essentially um, what market analysts do a lot of time. And we found that there are five different clusters of people who fall along the spectrum from wariness to engagement. And, and uh, sort of here, here's who they are. And in, in a way, again, sort of a frustrating thing for maybe anybody encountering this information, especially librarians, is that it doesn't map very neatly with the demographic categories you have in your heads. You know, you know when somebody uh, engages the library in many cases, whether they're Hispanic or Anglo. You know whether it's a man or a woman. You know whether it's an old person or a young person. You know whether it's a poor person or a well, better off person and stuff like that. This stuff is going on in people's heads. And it's not obvious by the way they dress or the car they drive or the way they sort of browse your stacks or anything like that. So it's, uh, in a way, you're going to have to think differently about your patrons if you want to um, be tuned in to this kind of information. But it's really useful because, it, it, uh, I, I, as I said, the Carol Dweck work is so clear that these traits cross demographic boundaries. These are psychographic realities that matter a lot in your life. Um, and, and in our report, you'll see how we did this work. And you might even attempt some version of it uh, with your own uh, patrons. But anyway, here are the five categories. The first group is the information wary, and it's about a quarter of the population. Uh, they don't have deep interest in information when you ask them about those uh, variety of sources. They have steeply low trust. They are at the bottom of the scale of trusting information sources of all kinds. Um, and they're not, they don't, when we ask them, do you want to learn more? Would you like tutorials? Would you like um, a concierge next to you doing this stuff? They're not all in for that. In many cases, there are life stressors that are going on in their life that sort of block out um, other things. It's a group that's, um, it's, of all of the five groups, it's more male than any of the other groups. It's older. In some cases, what we see with older folks is their, their hunger or, and their need for information is, is down a little bit because in some cases they're not in the job market. They're no longer worrying about their relevance of their skills for seeking employment and stuff like that. Um, and, and so th that's, that's one of the things that's going on here. The other thing that we found, and it's a real strong predictor of library users themselves, is whether you have a minor child in your house. If you have a kid who's uh, under 18 years old, you are way more likely to be a library user, and it turns out to be um, uh, more engaged with information than people who don't have uh, kids of that age uh, in their households. It's a, it's a, it turns out to be a, a strong predictor of lots of kind of things. Then there's an, a group that's uh, sort of one step removed from them. We call them the information adult. And again, it's about a quarter of the population. So if you take the fully wary and the adult, it's half the population. And if you remember that earlier slide, about half the population uses a library in any uh, given calendar year. This maps pretty closely with that. The adult and the, and the wary are folks who are not necessarily of your universe. Um, they're, they, they're, they look. Uh, pretty average uh, when you run the data um, of, the, of the characteristics that we were measuring. Um, their, their level of interest in information is just slightly below the average public interest. Um, their library use is, uh, is on par, uh, a little bit lower than, um, than the average, but not too terribly much. Uh, what, what really distinguishes them is how little they trust formal, institutional, portions of information. They just, they, they, they are um, angry, skeptical, uh, dis distrusting folks. Um, 
They are, uh, they're, they are often multitaskers, and so they're time stressed when they're, they're thinking about um, information use. Um, and we asked a, a bunch of sort of lifestyle questions, and this is the group that was most likely to say, I have trouble relaxing. So they're, you know, it's not so much that they're on the go, it's, it's just there are stressors in their life that are constantly impinging on them and weighing on them. Um, and when we asked them, would you like to learn more? Would you think about using the library and stuff like that? They don't think um, that would fit uh, with their lives. It's a group, again, that tilts male, not as much as the fully wary. Um, interestingly enough, uh, better off households, household, people who live in households with $75,000 of income or more are overrepresented in this group. And so uh, you can, in some ways, feel that some of the stressors on their life are just the sort of day-to-day. -day. They're, they're fitting their job in maybe with kids, maybe with um, other st you know, stressors in their life. And it tilts suburban, interestingly enough. So they're, so they're deeply distrustful. They're, they're, they're not, their circumstances aren't you know, dire or things like that, but they, they, you, getting them over, over that trust hurdle is a, is a big um, thing. Then there's a group that's the cautious and the curious. It's about uh, one in eight of the population. These folks are interested in information, so that right off that they're, they're different from those other two groups. Um, but they, there are time stresses on their life that keep them from uh, paying attention to it or focusing on it. Uh, they have below levels of trust, but these are the folks who do have a lot of interest in acquiring uh, digital skills and figuring out um, how to find information that they can trust. So they are really open. They're, they're stressed and they're not, they're not necessarily fully engaged with information, but they're quite open to the kinds of things that librarians can do for them. Uh, and that's a, that's a distinctive hallmark of them. Um, they also express an interest in getting the information and getting the training to figure out how to find their pathway to stuff. They've, um, they've, you've got to, in some cases, get through that, the trust wariness that they have. Um, and they obviously need to sort, of, sort of carve out time in their life um, to, to do this. Um, it looks like the general population across the board by most demographic traits, by most of these psychographic traits, they're average. Uh, but what's distinctive about them is their willingness and interest. They know they're, they're, they've got things to uh, get through, but they're also quite open to um, training and, and, and figuring out how to trust uh, information. The eager and willing, here's another dog one that I thought you'd enjoy. Um, that's about a fifth of the population. And I would argue that this is the most interesting group from the perspective of librarians, because these are the people that you guys wake up thinking, how are we going to meet their needs even better today than we did yesterday? Um, they are really interested in news uh, and information across the board and all those topics we asked about. Um, and they are fairly trusting of those, of those um, old, old institutional sources uh, that obviously are still important in communities. And these folks don't approach information by sort of saying, uh, with a jaundiced eye, I, I don't trust who this is. I don't like who they are. I don't have any sense that they're, what they're going to feed me is going to be uh, good and useful stuff. Uh, more than any group, they trust their family and friends and you guys to help them get on the path to finding the right information and the most useful stuff. They, um, they, they will take recommendations from you. They're predisposed to trust you and like you. And uh, you know, that makes them awesome from a librarian perspective. Um, they don't have uh, digital information tools. So again, right back to the sort of thing that I'm talking about here, uh, technology use of needs of patrons, you guys providing technology in their life. And it's not just necessarily, but importantly, computers in libraries, but maybe letting them do, borrow WiMAX uh, um, routers or other gadgetry that they can use because they don't necessarily have access to everything. Your Wi-Fi connections in the library, these are the people that sometimes sit outside your library after the hours that it's closed and do their homework or play games or w watch things and, and stuff like that. But they, are, they love that you have uh, made the investments you have in technology. They also um, really would love um, to, be, uh, to acquire the skills of how to be a better information consumer. They would like to know how to find the trustworthy stuff. They would like to improve their digital skills. They're not, they're not necessarily uh, confident of their search skills, for instance. Uh, and so they are, are eager uh, for training in that. And they'd love to know sort of how to be um, information literate, where to 
get the most trustworthy kinds of information. Um, and interestingly enough, again, we asked about how is the, is the distance between you and your library a barrier to your doing what you want to do? Uh, and these are the folks who most likely to report that longer hours at the libraries and access to libraries would, be, would matter a lot to them. Expanding your hours, expanding your programming, um, somehow finding ways to meet them closer to where literally they live, that would be a good thing. And the, they're most interesting to me, uh, those traits are fascinating and important, but they're also um, a really interesting group. They're, it's a minority majority population. It's more um, African Americans and Latinos are in this group than whites. They don't have uh, high levels of education and they're aware of that. That's why they want to hand over some of this um, these, the, the facilities for gathering information or, or, or processes for gathering information, they'd love you guys to be along for the ride or even to, to teach them this. They're relatively young. It's, it, I think it's the youngest group. Um, and, and so they, these are, are the folks that you, many of you, are, are deeply concerned about and the whole reason you got into your profession. Then there are the information confidence. It's about one in six. We've done all sorts of modeling of heavy duty library lovers and library patrons. This is this group. It's, it almost number for number matches up previous work that we did where we did a typology of library lovers. Um, they love you. They love information. It, they are the most um, um, information um, engaged, they um, make decisions after gathering lots of information, they have open mindsets, they don't necessarily have, um, they don't describe themselves anyway as having sort of a predis uh, predisposition to go one way or another on decisions and, and things like that. Uh, they're really interested in all kinds of news and information, they're really thankful that librarians can bring both enlightenment and enrichment to their lives. They have a lot of technology and you guys are just part of the ecosystem of information that is uh, appealing to them and fits into their lives. Uh, they don't necessarily need much more training. You don't have to think much about them, but one of the ways that you could think about them is if somehow you could identify these people, they will help you. They will be volunteers, tutors, mentors, uh, aides, supporters, and stuff like that. For they have open mindsets. They don't necessarily have. Um, they don't describe themselves anyway as having sort of a predis uh, predisposition to go one way or another on decisions and and things like that. Uh, they're really interested in all kinds of news and information. They're really thankful that librarians can bring both enlightenment and enrichment to their lives. They have a lot of technology, and you guys are just part of the ecosystem of information that is uh, appealing to them and fits into their lives. Uh, they don't necessarily need much more training. You don't have to think much about them, but one of the ways that you could think about them is if somehow you could identify these people, they will help you. They will be volunteers, tutors, mentors, uh, aides, supporters, and stuff like that for um, the work that professional librarians do. And I, I've argued until I'm blue in the face that th this is a population to cherish and nurture and engage as deeply as you can. Because these are the people who evangelize for you. If, you, you know, if you're worried about your standing with stakeholders and funders, their word to those people matters more than the library director's word or the, you know, the library staff's word. Because if their enthusiasm for you, their ability to tell narratives about how the library serves them, how the library serves community, it's gold. And, it, and, the, and the goldest of the gold in that group is mommy bloggers. Because uh, they got into blogging probably, uh, you know, sometime in the past decade or so because they were going to have a child or they just ha had a child and, and writing about that experience matters a lot to them. And I would, it's not even bloggers, it's sort of people who do this on Facebook a lot too and Pinterest um, would be part of it. Um, but soon enough, a lot of their writing and thinking um, expands to what's going on in the community, what's happening in schools, how are, uh, are the education policies, the zoning policies, the environmental policies, the transit policies, the health policies in our community serving our community. So watching these people grow as news and information sources is an amazing thing and they adore you. As their kid is under age six, they would probably trade their life to be a librarian. It's that, it's that level of enthusiasm. So thinking that they are out there evangelizing for you would be a good thing. 
Um, it's interestingly enough, the information confident are, are sort of equally male and female. They're more likely to be white uh, than the general population is. Uh, they are younger uh, and they are better educated. It is, it, this is a profile we've seen of lots of library enthusiasts. So how do people uh, assess libraries? Um, we ask people about um, a general question. Do you think the library um, helps you in these variety of ways? And this first slide is things where overwhelming numbers of people think that libraries help them. Even if they're not, again, library patrons, they know people that you serve well, or they like that you serve others in the community well on this. So finding information that's trustworthy. Underlining this, bolding this is a really important thing because it's become um, a huge uh, cultural statement that you know, making sure that information is trustworthy is a, is a sort of newly urgent thing in the new environment that this culture finds itself in. And you guys are top of mind for people who um, everybody thinks can, or, or three quarters of the people think, can get them the best, most reliable, uh, bankable, actionable information in their lives. They also, at, at the same level, talk about librarians really well serving them, learn new things. Um, they talk about growth, uh, personal growth. 65% say libraries help them grow as people. 56% uh, say that the libraries help them get information that helps them make decisions. So those are good. Those are, um, you know, if you were looking at a political chart like this, they, you'd say they were landslide affirmations of libraries. These are not so much. There's a, there's a split verdict on whether libraries help people focus on things that matter in their life. Not that that should, should be a major role, but it's, it, we asked that just to sort of get a reading on, on how people thought that way. Uh, helps them cope with the busy world, 43% uh, say yes, so it's not a, at all a trivial number, but it's not the majority number. 38% say libraries help them cope with a world where it's hard to get ahead. Again, th so these are the people who are also taking those courses, doing that online stuff, and feeling the urgency of, of trying to recover from what happened in 2008 and 2009, where everybody was doing sort of a, a personal inventory and reckoning about where do I fit into the job market. And then um, protecting personal data from online thieves, they don't, uh, a quarter say that they, you help them with that. That's a big role that you could play, and I'll have some more data on that in a minute. But people would love libraries to play a ba bigger role in helping people navigate the sort of treachery of, of, of privacy problems uh, in the age where pretty much everything that we do and know is cataloged and um, profiled on us somewhere. We also asked, do you think you know, your local public library provides you with the resources you need? 77% said yes, awesome. Um, I know that it, that's in some ways a distressing number because you would like more, because you know exactly how you would spend more um, and, and, and make people's lives even better. But this is a nice way of people sort of saying, even with the struggles libraries have had in the past generation, with staff cuts, budget cuts, and things like that, the library still is a, um, you know, an amazing place to get what you need. Then we asked folks um, about how much do you think the local library contributes to the following things in your community and being a safe place. You can't overstate how important it is, especially for parents, that the library is just a safe space. The other people who rhapsodize about this are people who just love library um, reading spaces. It's a, in, in a way, it's, it's the sanctuary that they go to to retreat from a world that seems too busy. Their eyes, and so they love that about you. They also are deeply appreciative of your creating uh, educational opportunities for people of all ages. Again, that's uh, that way that people talk about you serving uh, community needs. Um, helping spark creativity in young people, that's a, that's a nice little attribute that people give to you. Providing a trusted place for people to learn about new technologies. Again, they think you've rebranded as tech hubs, and that's what that number is all about. 38% uh, say that libraries uh, promote a sense of community among different groups in your area, um, in an era where we're so anxious about communities becoming more polarized, more tribal, more us versus them. The library is seen as a, a, a sort of safe and encouraging and empathetic place. Um, and serving as a gathering place uh, for uh, community meetings and things like that, it's, it's, those are notable numbers uh, too. 
And we always ask, if the library closed, what would it mean to you? We get the consistent readings. We've done this three times. 66% say it would have a major impact on their community. 33% say it would have a major impact on me and my family. So there's a, there's a gap to notice there that, again, in the public imagination, you're great for the wealth of things that you are providing for everybody in the community. In terms of me and my needs, not so much. I wouldn't worry too much about those numbers, but you, you know, to the degree that you're always thinking because you are there for them and in some respects you only might provide what they need and if you don't provide it, nobody provides it, uh, you, know, you might close that gap by thinking that way. And then you have a mandate uh, on this education piece that I wanted to sort of call out um, in a separate way. We ask people, should libraries maybe do something, should they definitely do something, or should they definitely not do something? 85% say libraries should definitely coordinate more closely with local schools. They think librarians are, are sort of magic makers that can help the local school system, and in some respects to the degree that they're worried about local schools, they think libraries can uh, complement, supplement, and even sort of be special things that schools can't be to kids. They also say that uh, libraries should offer free early literacy programs to young folks. Again, huge mandate because everybody's um, thinking now that kids have to be prepared to even enter school and that new literacies are required to be both a good citizen and a productive worker in this economy. And they, um, they think libraries should definitely um, offer programs to allow people, including kids and senior citizens, to use digital um, tools. Um, and in part, these education functions matter because 73% of Americans self-define as lifelong learners. And interestingly, when he asked this question in 2015, I think it was, I went back, because you always want to know if there's a trend in data, so I wanted to see if anybody had ever asked this question before, and nobody had. So I can't say whether that 73% number is an upswing from a, from a, a time in the past or not. I, I, you have to believe, though, it is. And I, I, again, I think the 2008 Great Recession was a very stark moment in people's lives where they had to do a personal inventory about how prepared they were, how educated they were, how um, refined their skills were for the marketplace of the future. And, and so, um, in a way, it's surprising that this number might not be even higher, but you know, our surveys are of everybody, so it includes retirees and, and the disabled and, and um, you know, folks who don't work in the labor market and stuff like that. Um, and the reason that people um, feel like lifelong learners and feel like libraries matter to them is that lifelong learning has its own sort of joys and virtues. It's not just for the instrumental purpose of getting better at my job or, or getting an, another job that's even better than my current one, but learning stuff just enchants these people. Um, they, and also, there's a, a, a tone of altruism to it because they learn stuff that they can use to help others. If you look at the bottom line here, uh, that was my favorite number in the whole survey. 33% of lifelong learners, uh, personal learners, said they, they, want, they needed to learn something in the past year to help their children or other children at school. So there are ways in which there's sort of a deeply outward facing um, uh, per personality is, is, um, is also very much tied up with this uh, lifelong learning, people will live in networks, right? And you're serving your network better if you are uh, a smarter, better friend. And a lot of people um, are, are thinking that way. And then we finally get some data about how are libraries performing um, in this environment. 37% say libraries very well serve uh, the learning and educational needs of their communities. 39% say pretty well. So that's, those are nice numbers. They're not numbers to be embarrassed about. And then uh, 34% say libraries are very well serving the learning and educational needs of them and their families. 36% say pretty well. Again, those no actually those numbers are very close, the community number and the personal number, so not bad. Um, there are always uh, probably more things to do with that. So there, I, I, the Aspen Institute uh, a couple of years ago did a wonderful paper uh, that was funded by the Gates Foundation about the sort of the future of libraries. A lot of um, enterprises have been thinking about that. This was a really first class piece of work and so if you um, if you do a search on Aspen Future of Libraries you will find the report uh, they did on this and they, they talked about libraries in three dimensions as as people, places, and platforms. And so using our data to sort of inform that um, schema 
Um, I'm suggesting here there are a couple of functions that librarians could uh, well um, play for the patrons who are deeply engaged and even some of those who are not deeply engaged. The, uh, the first thing is trusted information. In, in a contentious environment where there are so many disputes about what a fact is and so much trouble discerning whether it's coming from a trustworthy source or not and the fact checking ecosystem is doing a great job and it's growing but it still can't keep up with all the ways that information is spun uh, or you know, built on disinformation or God forbid, you know, the new term that's being applied to it is weaponized. You know, they, with, with the intentional purpose of in converting someone, making them matter, making the enemy seem more, you know, uh, evil or, or stuff like that. Th this, this, th the public sees a deep hunger for the need for institutions like libraries and people like librarians to help them sort of sort out this very sort of treacherous thing. Obviously now there's, a, there's an elevated sense that librarians can, can be and should be curators and arbiters of trusted information. You, you know, if you put out you know, references to this, this is good, this is solid stuff, even if it's contentious stuff, I would say that you're serving your communities well. Obviously, they want you to be uh, technology, and increasingly, they want you to be data uh, experts. You know, the, the thing that we're moving into, the Internet of Things and big data, is just something that's going to influence a lot of people's lives. And they, you know, gosh darn it, I wish you didn't have more missions heaped on your shoulders, but you do. You, you know, somebody on your staff is going to have to be fluent in data use and data abuse to make sure that people don't get hosed in this environment. They obviously think that you guys are, are lifelong learners and, they, and seeing you do that and having you teach them maybe how to do that would be a wonderful function for libraries. And I, I have the grand thing down here, visionaries for the knowledge economy and the jobs it produces. Nobody has had to reinvent themselves more dramatically than librarians in the past generation, right? And so you've been through this process. You were already sort of instinctively inclined to do it well anyway because of who you are. Um, but, but people have observed that. Uh, actually, people, if you ask them about stress in libraries, they can speak pretty well to that. So you guys are models for this kind of stuff. And, and thinking how you mo more directly plug into people's thinking about job readiness and job relevance um, can be also be um, something that you provide to them. On the, on the place, so that's the people part. The place part, um, you um, need to reconfigure and repurpose, which I know every library in, uh, in this country and in other countries are doing. So the Internet of Things is here to stay. There are a couple of ways that it's directly relevant uh, to libraries about you know, inventory management and stuff like that, but also understanding a lot more about your patrons and, uh, and, and their needs and, and things like that. Um, it, the, the place itself now is elevating in the public imagination as, as a place to meet. So, you know, the library is a safe place, it's easy to schedule, it's convenient, it's, uh, it, it's you know, usually a central spot in many communities to meet. And in some respects, if we can invite librarians into our conversation, we get smarter just for that. And so you might be called upon in the years to come to uh, be hosts and or moderators of or, uh, or expert resources in those places. Obviously, librarians are, are actively thinking about how they can fill in holes in the information marketplace. Uh, English as a second language stuff is second nature to many libraries, offering GED equivalency programs, uh, offering um, preschool. A lot of libraries now are, are putting a big emphasis and priorities on doing preschool programs. Um, a, a bunch of libraries are thinking about how to be sort of one-stop shops for local entrepreneurs and, and business folks for uh, the process of growing their business or launching their business. And there's other stuff in our data that just says veterans are, and, and active duty personnel matter a lot as a special group in this culture. And to the degree that institutions are focusing on their needs, uh, you will get lots of credit for that and, and lots of appreciation uh, for that. And then finally, as a community resource, um, you know, it's going to the 2.0 version of the things that you guys have always done well. Um, being a place that it sort of sits at the center of the learning ecosystem of your communities, obviously being an advocate for free and open. The internet community, the technology community is depending on you guys to be allies in that fight because there are so many forces in the culture that want to shut down free and open in lots of ways. Um, uh, you guys, uh, my first engagements with librarians taught me very dramatically and very quickly, you guys care a lot about digital divides. 
and, and, and not, it's not only in access to technology, but now in the dimensions that I was talking about today, people are divided by their wariness or their engagement with information and trying to make sure that those gaps are as narrow as they possibly can be in your communities is something a lot of librarians uh, can, can embrace and I think uh, be satisfied with. And finally, helping people navigate um, privacy problems. And even, I, I suggest this from time to time, and some librarians uh, about faint when I do it, but being algorithms watchdogs. Because algorithms are increasingly important in what happens in this world, and, and our data are used in ways to steer us in one direction or another, or serve us the information that we need as opposed to other information that they think, well, we're not as interested in. You guys being the fact checkers on that in some way, shape, or form would be something that uh, the world would um, appreciate. Um, this cat wasn't in trouble after the drop here, so don't worry about that. Uh, but I want to end with um, my song to librarians that I always sing, which is um, we've been doing this work about the impact of technology on people for 17 years, and five years before we came into existence, Pew was sort of marking the beginning of, of, the, of the digital revolution. And it's been so interesting to study because it, it touches every major part of our culture, it touches who we are, the essence of human identity, it touches what our communities are, the essence of, of how we get together in groups and get along as groups or not get along in groups. It certainly touches on people's capacity to learn and act in their own uh, behalf in better and better ways. But, you know, these are the lifelong missions of librarians and, and, your, and your predecessors, thank God for that. But you're bringing those tools, those skills, and that sensibility to a whole new host of things that matter a lot. So it's scary to be in this disrupted environment. It's a challenge to try to navigate all of these paradoxes that I've been describing in my talk. But just as a citizen, my song to librarians is thank you for being there. Because without you folks in these conversations about who we are, what we share, how we create knowledge, how we share knowledge, and how we process knowledge. Without you guys in those conversations, um, darker forces might be um, shaping them. And those voices that you bring are the essential citizen voices uh, to the most urgent and important stuff that I can think of in our culture. So as a citizen, on behalf of all those people we interview, I'm going to say thank you.